Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us for today's lunchtime webinar for day four of our um, very first Marine Economy Week, uh, which is a series of daily webinars exploring all aspects of Scotland's prosperous marine or sometimes blue economy. Um, delighted to have you here. My name is Tony Cameron. I'm a partner in the banking team at Harp McLeod with a particular focus on marine economy, uh, in particular in relation to vessel finance. Uh, launching this Marine Economy Week is part of uh, our recognition of the scale, value and importance of the marine economy in Scotland um, and the involvement of Harvard McLeod in very many aspects of that um, across almost all legal disciplines. As a firm um, which began in Glasgow with the clear, strong maritime traditions, we've always had clients in this area, but um, it's grown and flourished as we've spread throughout Scotland and clearly our Shetland presence is um, increase to the, the amount of marine related work that we are doing. Um, so, so far this week in uh, our Marine Economy Week, um, we've heard from Morgan Cameron at HIE setting the scene for the week and identifying how vital the marine economy is, both in Scotland and globally, and the scale of the opportunities. Um, we've considered technology innovation and research in the sector with uh, Harvard McLeod partners Paula Skinner and Jamie Watt together with uh, Mark to Clark, patent attorneys. Um, we've considered all things trade post-Brexit with senior associate from Mark McLeod, Peter McClucky, and Tron from our friends at Norwegian law firm Thomason. And tomorrow we have a final session on marine and offshore renewables with a panel of um, Mark McLeod Energy Partners and Jason Schofield of Green Marine. Uh, before turning to today's session about housekeeping to point out, your cameras and microphones are off for the webinar today, but we'd very much like to hear from you. So um, please um, pass any questions through the chat box function and we'll endeavour to get through those at the end of the session. Um, if we don't manage to do that, we will look to get in touch with you after the event and get an answer to you, dear query. From a social media perspective, if you're tweeting, please feel free to use the hashtag MEW21. Um, so to, today, to today's session, um, I'm joined today by my colleague and fellow partner, John Pringle. I'm also delighted to be joined by Mike Bezine, Sales Manager for the UK at International Shipyards Group, Damon. So thank you both for joining me today. We're going to be discussing vessels, finance and funding. Mike uh, is clearly the main attraction, not being a lawyer. Uh, and he will give us an insight into his and Damon's experience of the UK vessel marketplace. Either side of that will be myself and John Pringle um, on funding related matters, with John running through the various stages of the vessel life cycle and ensuring funder readiness at each of those stages. Um, I'll be starting off the session today with a quick run through of a few hot topics we are seeing in the funding market at present. First off is a uh, LIBOR transition, which is not uh, specific to the vessel market in any way, but it is very relevant um, given the, the funding in the market. Um, LIBOR is a London interbank offered rate and is used as a basis for interest in a, a large number of commercial and corporate loans. Um, without getting into masses of detail, it's the average rate that banks will lend prepared to lend to each other uh, and has historically been calculated based on a panel uh, of global banks. It's therefore a forward-looking rate. It looks at what the rate that the, the money would be lent at. Uh, LIBOR is to be phased out at the end of 2021. Um, the reason for that is following the global financial crisis in 2008, uh, investigators uncovered widespread manipulation of that rate by uh, global banks and in any event the marketplace has now changed that banks no longer rely on uh, interbank borrowing for funding and that the, that market is therefore no longer liquid and as a result the, the, the submissions made to, to calculate LIBOR effectively expert judgment rather than based on actuality. Um, so given that it's no longer representative market conditions the FCA has announced it will no longer compel submissions and the LIBOR is to be ceased to be published by the end of 2021. LIBOR will be replaced by a benchmark, which is an alternative risk-free rate, reference rate, 
Um, the preferred rate is going to be something called SONIA, uh, which is a sterling overnight index average. Um, again, without getting into massive detail, SONIA is backward looking and looks at actual transactions that have taken place. So therefore, it seems more reliable and sustainable. Um, a word will come back to another context later. Um, than LIBOR, given it's actually got a volume of transactions underpinning it. Um, SONIA won't be used as a straight swap for LIBOR on all occasions, um, likely to be bigger value facilities, loan facilities, uh, and where interest rate hedging will be involved. Um, otherwise, we are seeing other facilities moving just onto Bank of England base rate. Uh, so Bank of England and the FCA have tasked funders with moving existing loans away from LIBOR and not putting any new loans onto LIBOR, and that, that is continuing. Um, the obligations talked about are on banks there, but clearly it's very relevant to borrowers to know their exposure to this and the impact of the changes. So clearly they need to carry out internal reviews to, to see what the exposure is, uh, consider contracts, including bonds, um, very relevant to the sector, loan documents, any other commercial agreements that, that tap on LIBOR as a, as a rate for uh, interest or, or, or default interest in that contract. So uh, it's important to understand what's coming and, and, and to, to consider it. And in addition, um, there are additional spreads, i.e. further interest added to Sonia and also Bay Street, where that replaces LIBOR as Banks effectively try to create um, effectively the same economic outturn uh, by using these new rates. So uh, some of these can be quite complex in the documentation that's developed so far. So there is a need um, to focus on that and, and consider it. So um, worth mentioning, um, as I say, not specific to marine, but clearly given the loan facilities uh, in the sector, it's relevant to mention. Um, Next point I want to mention is COVID practicalities. A um, few things to mention here. Firstly, generally, we're finding that turnaround times of registries worldwide are taking longer, uh, which is supposed to be expected and therefore needs to be borne in mind when uh, we're trying to do transactions. Um, the MC in Cardiff is taking longer than it was previously uh, in terms of the UK but um, it hasn't at any point ground to halt in the way that, for example, the Irish registry seemed to at one point before. It has improved since, albeit not, um, still not back to where we'd like it to be. Um, the MC is also endeavouring to be quite flexible and is accepting PDF copies of documents um, as opposed to other registries, for example, Norway, where notarised and legalised documents are still required in very short timelines, which brings a level of um, practical complexity to matters. Uh, another related COVID um, issue, um, getting hold of original documents for transfers or financings or refinancings. For example, original chip mortgage documents need to be uh, the release element signed and, and returned. That's obviously proved difficult given, to, given limited access or no access in some cases. I know a number of banks have no access to premises uh, to get hold of those documents. Uh, the MCA are accepting PDF documents, as I mentioned, so bills of sale, so that's helpful, um, and have been accepting release letters as an alternative to um, original mortgage documents being returned. Uh, they were pre-approving these letters as an alternative, uh, but we've learned over the last few days they're ceasing to do that, which also then brings another uh, slight risk in terms of timing and, and acceptance of submissions for transactions. So, I mean, generally we're seeing registries applying pragmatism and flexibility, but it is on a case-by-case -case basis and a register-by-register -register basis, and sometimes individual by individual. So uh, I suppose just to bear in mind that it needs some pre-thought and pre-planning uh, around transactions. Um, signatures, uh, the ability to, to get people's signatures and get documents returned. Uh, the last 12 months have seen a real explosion in the use of 
electronic signature platform such as DocuSign, and that's been very helpful. However, Scots law is still some way behind England and Wales, uh, and as a result, there are documents that still need to be wet and signed and returned, which, again, gives us a logistical issue. Um, finally, on COVID practicalities, uh, we've spent quite a lot of time focusing on contracts and shipbuild contracts, uh, the latter in particular in relation to delivery and ongoing monitoring and inspection, um, and considering timelines and notice periods, uh, given uh, the travel restraints that may exist in different jurisdictions of the buyer and the seller and the builder, um, and uh, the unpredictability of that until the um, degree unknown of when COVID ceases to be the significant issue it is now. Um, so we've had to give that consideration in relation to transactions um, touching on Turkey, Croatia, Spain, among many others. So uh, linked to that, force majeure clauses then take on quite a bit of significance in terms of extensions of potential extensions of time uh, due to workforce issues um, in a jurisdiction, or as I say, the ability to travel for inspections and delivery. So. Uh, again, elements that have um, needed some focus over this um, last 12 months or so. Brexit, um, you were glad when I said I was doing a quick run through. I'm not going to spend very long on Brexit, given we could spend hours on it, I'm sure. A uh, couple of very quick things. Um, there's clearly been a significant impact on fishing and fisheries due to border issues, and we spent time advising clients on the impact of those issues on current funding and future funding projects. Uh, also worth mentioning is the need for more thought to be given now to enforcement of judgments and effectively enforcement of obligations of counterparties where we're dealing with jurisdictions that at one point were part of the European Union but are no longer. Um, so not insurmountable but uh, it just means that we need to be thinking more about that and taking more detailed advice from local council uh, to deal to ensure that where we're dealing with counterparties in those jurisdictions, that we are not just documenting obligations, but making sure that they're enforced, enforceable. Um, a recent example was, I think I mentioned Croatia a second ago, but we've had that experience quite recently um, in terms of just ensuring that that all worked as we intended. Um, finally, for me, sustainability uh, and green finance. Um, it's an issue that's come up more than once already this Marine Economy Week. And I think Mike will be touching on it in some respects in a, a slightly different context when he speaks shortly. Um, but and I know it's a, a, an area of real interest to many of our attendees. Um, it's increasingly becoming a hot topic, probably intensified by COP26 taking place in Glasgow for this year and the, the, the looming climate change uh, emergency. COVID has also accelerated the drive for uh, consideration of sustainability um, and all the, the knock-on impacts COVID's had on uh, our footprint and um, the way in which we're living it, our lives and our, our working lives. Um, so uh, these areas are becoming more and more important to funders um, together with the ESG agenda. Um, the government's green finance strategy splits this out, uh, splits out the, the, the two kind of key areas um, quite helpfully. Um, greening of finance, so effectively current and future financial risks and opportunities from climate and environmental issues are integrated into mainstream financial decision making. So Funders increasingly will be looking um, and are looking at basic part of credit appraisal on ability to meet sustainability, environmental ESG targets, um, and showing that it's demonstrated in order to, to create an environmentally sustainable economy. Um, a developing trend, which we've seen uh, some of already, uh, particularly in relation to shipping and offshore industries, is economic incentivization of, of, of these um, Benchmarks within loan documents, um, for example, margin ratchets. So, 
high yield, interest rates being tweaked up and down um, on meeting or, or failing to meet these uh, targets. Um, and uh, this is going to begin to pervade um, lending uh, more and more. And the Loan Market Association, who issues or consider to be market standard loan documents, have issued green loan principles and sustainability loan principles uh, with a view to that. Um, so that, that, that's effectively what the UK government describes as greening of finance. Another aspect is financing green, which is accelerating financial support for green projects, green initiatives, uh, and ensuring that they get the financial infrastructure they need. Uh, an example of that is the green bond market is now worth in excess of $100 billion globally. And more locally, there's the UK Green Investment Bank based in Edinburgh, now independent of government as a, as a, as a tool to try and achieve that. Uh, the third limit of the government strategy is in relation to the, the exploitation of that a, for financial services worldwide, which is less relevant to uh, what we're discussing today. Um, what is worth mentioning is, however, the increasing transparency is going to come um, on financial risk of climate change and climate change related financial disclosures uh, through the task force for climate related financial disclosures. So effectively companies having to be more transparent and disclose more about the impact of these on their business and call that sure very relevant to marine economy. Um, as I say, it's an area we are seeing more and more of. I'm actually speaking at a, a webinar with an uh, international law firm, Osborne Clark, leading up to COP26 on financing net zero, um, linked to, uh, in part, Mark Carney's private finance paper on net zero, which focuses on the reporting I just mentioned, focuses on risk management in relation to businesses and the, on the physical and transitional risks around climate change, and also the possibility, also looking at exploiting the returns that are available to funders in that market and mobilising an infrastructure to, to let that investment happen. Um, obviously, all of that we've mentioned is in addition to, and I think Mike will be touching this again as well, uh, increasing regulation in a wider sense on shipping and offshore companies uh, in respect of the environmental impact. Um, given the World Bank definition of blue economy that um, Morvan mentioned on Monday, talks of sustainable use of the ocean resources, hopefully this sustainable and green um, focus will fit quite nicely with the marine economy and hopefully can be harnessed by the markets, especially given the focus on clean energy, efficiency, low carbon infrastructure and transport, uh, which obviously all plays to uh, a number of different subsets of the marine economy. So uh, that is just about it for me. So I'll take this point to hand over to Mike and let him um, give us an insight uh, from his and Damon's perspective on the UK vessel market. Over to you, Mike. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tony. Uh, very happy to be here. Um, I was asked to to give a presentation on um, on the, the the Scottish market, UK market, Scottish markets in particular, from a shipbuilder's point of view. Um, as you rightfully said, I'm not a lawyer, so it's going to be very technical and and how technical companies, shipbuilders in this uh, in this case, look at um, um, at, at law and regulation in um, in the markets in Scotland. For those of you who do not know Darman, I will share my screen so i can do a small introduction on um on darman do you tony could you tell me whether you see my screen the darman presentation yes i can see that mike thank you yeah okay great well a short a short introduction to um to darman before um before i i, I start on all the legal matters uh, for those of you again who don't who don't know the company uh, we're a, a Dutch company based in the Netherlands. The head offices are in the Netherlands. Um, it's a worldwide company, more than 10,000 employees, 35 yards all over the world. Um, not in the UK. Uh, that's <laughs> a bit strange, maybe. But um, there we are. This is this is the whole world. Still quite a number of um, uh, companies in the Netherlands itself. And then from South Africa into China, Vietnam, Indonesia, 
uh, Australia and uh, and in the Americas, doing about 170 ships worldwide uh, per year on on deliveries. Um, our strong point is standardization. So we we always try and sell proven concept, proven designs, uh, giving short delivery times, competitive pricing, of course, and of course the proven technology, which I just uh, mentioned. Um, continuous improvement with our our customers uh, all over the world. Um, one of the things of interest I find is that most of our the ships and the types that we that we do in Scotland are workboats. That's tugs. Uh, multi-cat shoal bus. There's all sorts of workboats for uh, originally the oil and gas industry, um, renewables nowadays, and of course um, the aquaculture, the aquaculture market. Um, Harbour and terminal is is one of the strong points of Garmin. One of the typical products is is the Azimut stern drive tugs. Just to give you an impression, uh, this is one of our 2810s uh, compact, very strong tug. Um, uh, sailing in the UK as well. Uh, the offshore oil and gas, as you can see, one of the bigger one of the bigger ships. This is a Canadian ship. This is an English ship for Bibby in uh, in Liverpool in the renewables industry. Uh, one of the so-called hotel ships or, or SOVs, as they are as they are known worldwide. Pontoons and barges. The picture is real. <laughs> for those of you who don't don't know these these transports from China going into into Europe quite often. Uh, more than 10 barges uh, are, are shipped in one go from our yards in, in China, Vietnam, to usually Rotterdam for redistribution in um, in Europe. Uh, dredging is another market uh, we do. You can see a multi-cat. This is a Dutch multi-cat. Van Oort is, is the customer, but we've got quite a few uh, Scottish customers with these um, these types of um, of boats as well. Public transport, ferries. This is a picture in, in uh, the city of Rotterdam. Um, we do again sell these boats worldwide. We haven't been able to to deliver to um, Scotland yet. Um, who knows in the future? Uh, because obviously that's uh, that's an interesting market as far as as, uh, as, as ferries are concerned. Uh, and of course the aquaculture market. This is a Norwegian uh, example, so you can you can tell by um, all the examples that it's quite international. Um, and again, this ship sails in the Norwegian fjords and quite often is chartered by Scottish customers, uh, customers like Maui, for instance, uh, in the in the Western uh, Western Isles. Um, legal legal issues. Um, you can see a whole a whole bunch of of um, actions here, which which are important nowadays in, in the worldwide. Uh, economy of, of shipbuilding and delivery, and of course in the United Kingdom as well, the code of conduct, the anti-bribery, uh, all the controls and sanctions—they all have to be in place these days. And that, that nowadays, rightfully so, is a very strict um, rule of compliance in doing business in the shipbuilding industry with with our uh, various markets. Um, what we find very important as Darman, being a, a family company, is the long-term relationship in the markets which we have with our, our customers. So that's that's number 10 in this list, Diamond Values. It's definitely um, family family values that we try to um, adhere to in, in, in the markets. Um, I'm not trying to be, be cheap and make this um, like a promotional um, uh, presentation, but um, it's got it's got its um, influence on how we deal with legal matters. So that's why I'm 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 mentioning this. Um, when I sell a boat, um, I look at the boat itself. I look at the specification. I look at, um, and, and the customer does so too. Um, the specification uh, has to adhere to um, classification bodies. So that's Lloyd's Register. That's Bureau Veritas. That's in the United Kingdom, of course, the MCA. Customers, MCA and ourselves during the sales process are worried about specifications, about the working conditions on, on board, the crewing. Uh, crewing has to fit the regulations nowadays, depending on the size of the of the boats, the sailing areas, um, the safety, uh, stability comes in play with these tugs and multi caps, for instance. So all that is on the, on the forefront of our, our minds when we have our discussions. Um, making a price or, or or being able to quote is obviously based on that on that technology. 
And then slowly, um, legal matters start creeping in, like um, under what uh, conditions do we do we offer uh, the the ship we're offering to to our customers? So Inco terms obviously are um, are, are in place. Uh, we prefer to sell uh, X Works, X Works to Diamond Shipyard. That could be a Diamond Shipyard in in the Netherlands. That's not so difficult. You can just come and pick it up. But then again, quite often we offer those X Works Diamond Vietnam or Diamond China or Singapore for that matter. So all these different Inco terms do come into into uh, play, um, which. Of course, is very very important for um, for a customer, and then the flexibility and 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 the help is needed to get these boats from uh, Singapore, for instance, uh, into um, into Scotland or or Rotterdam, where where a lot of our customers are more than happy to pick them up. Um, this is an important uh, factor where we start with with legal matters, simply because we do need to, as a shipbuilder, avoid. Um, the danger of all sorts of additional costs for us as um, as, as a shipyard. So that's where uh, income terms come in. That's where import taxes and duties come in, which which we need to um, need to avoid. Um, we do use our standard contracts. I think that's important as well. Um, we are not too far off from the BIMCO the BIMCO contracts. Um, and quite often that um, that w- that works quite well for um, for our customers. In that whole sales process, which I just described, um, the mentality—it's a mentality. It's 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 a way of talking to people. It's a way of of working together. Uh, finally, you got your your boats. You you got your specification. You got your MCA sort, matter sorted. The the, the um, uh, classification matters sorted. And then all of a sudden, oh dear, we got to have a contract as well. <laughs> and nobody is really prepared for that. Now now what do we do? So then then. We come up with a Darman uh, standard contract quite often and start discussing the contract. But but delivery times are usually under pressure. So um, it's it's the last sort of uh, matter, the last thing we, we think of um, in, in the whole process of actually selling a ship to a customer in, um, in, in the United Kingdom. Um, it may it may be not. Right, uh, it may not sound right for, for most of you being lawyers, um, but that's that's reality. That's how it um, how it works usually. Um, and then the the values come in over the last twelve months, uh, and this is very strange. Um, I did sell boats where a first down payment was made before the contract was actually signed, and we were still discussing the contract, and and, and payments were made. Um, so that's all based on trust, um, and, and, and trust I find in shipbuilding, especially work boats, where you've got to deliver quick and soon, is is of the utmost importance. You've got to get your administrative matters in order, of course. You've got to get that sorted. It's got to be right. But then again, without trust, it will um, it will never come to fruition. It will never it will never really um, really work. Um, I think that's that's a very practical example of of how we um, how we work. Um, the contracts that we we use deal usually with, of course, the um, um, well the payment conditions. Um, when we deliver real quick from stock, for instance, because we do build vessels on stock, payment conditions are usually quite uh, quite quite simple. It's a down payment and a payment upon upon delivery. If it's only a couple of months, uh, then again, if it's a new build, real new build ship, then you've got your your payment schedule to um, to agree uh, on with with the customer, and then the technical bits with with uh, a classification body comes in again, simply because you know um, hull ready, engines placed can be officially marked by classification uh, authorities, so they can come in, and they usually do come in on. Um, on payment conditions, on payment schedules, um, approvals of drawing, liability—that's that's the sort of standard um, um, things that come into into the contract. Permissible delay, non-permissible delay—that is quite often a, a discussion. Um, customers wanting it rather short, we wanting a little bit more lead time in um, in permissible delay, of course. 
um, inspections, uh, another discussion point in a contract will be approvals of drawings, for instance. In a standard design, we'd rather not have approval of drawings, uh, which you'll understand because it's a standard design. We want to keep on building according to our design. Uh, we do want to give insight into these drawings to customers. So again, one of the uh, one of the discussion points in um, in contracts, um, a very important one, and that's about uh, money, is bank guarantees um, or, or payments uh, guarantees. Um, we prefer not to have bank guarantees, um, and and some of the the, the banking uh, colleagues listening in may be <laughs> reluctant to, um, to to understanding that so, or not wanting it. Um, it as a ship builder, we find bank guarantees um, uh, money that we don't really need to spend uh, because we, as a, as, a, as a family company, been around for so long, we're a trustworthy company um, and we'll make sure you'll get, uh, you'll get the boat, um, especially if you've got your payment schedules covered by um, you know, schedule documents delivered by classification societies, for instance, just just a thought, and that's that's what I'm saying, just a thought, because we always try to, um, to avoid all these additional costs, and that's 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 what's um, what's what's about that. We can offer um, sometimes, not always accepted, uh, mother company guarantees, or for instance, transfers of ownership, retention right. That's that's all. Possible within the contracts that we that we um, discuss. Um, again, you know I'm, what I'm saying. The, the contracts are usually the last bit in, in the whole process of actually selling a ship. Um, the Brexit, uh, Tony, you mentioned Brexit. Uh, the consequences are not not great for us. We can sell to. Um, non-European companies, as, as, as you've seen, we, we're a worldwide company. We sell all over the world, so we can sell to the United Kingdom the way we always did. So there's really no um, no no limitation or or at, even administrative problems uh, given Brexit. The only thing we're we're ready for are, for instance, spare parts, so service deliveries. So far, we have not encountered any problems there because with our customers, we always discuss the spare parts they need for longer term, not just for a week or two, but for, you know, for, for two years usually. That's, that's usually the case when we deliver spare parts to, um, to ships and to customers. So, so far, no problems uh, yet. Of course, we don't know, um, we don't know how, that, how that will go in the future. Um, before I forget, going back to, to contracts again, uh, one of the discussion points we always have in contracts is, do we use UK law? I know UK law as such doesn't exist. It's England and Wales um, or, or Netherlands law. Um, we, as a Dutch company, prefer Netherlands law. Um, it, it's a bit um, simpler, um, more straightforward. Um, it's interpretation of the, um, of, of the contract and the wording in the contract versus, you know, the, the literal uh, translation. In, um, in in English law, so we prefer Dutch law. It gives us more flexibility, and we feel it, it's 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 very supportive of um, of customers as well. A lawyer will always look, or, or a judge will, all, in case um, you need them, <coughs> will always look at the meaning of the contract. Um, again, values. I come back to values. I have never ever, and I've been in sales for quite a long time, uh, needed a court case. Uh, in in sales in in a contract never, so that's um, that's um, I think is is a good sign. That's that's very very hopeful. Um, a different market um, in Scotland, for instance, um, in in well all over the world, but Scotland, you've got your your tenders. Uh, for instance, Northern Lighthouse Board is coming up with a tender. Um, Calmac, the ferry Seamal are coming up with tenders for replacement. And uh, the tenders are changing uh, these days, I find, and that will will find its way into contracts. I don't know exactly how that will how that will will go, but what we do see is that social responsibility is going to be more and more uh, uh, important in um, in tenders and and therefore in in contracts. Uh, local content, um, uh, you know, all that all that is going to to get a lot of attention in the in the very near. Uh, uh, future um, community benefits, you know, support for education, support for for developing local skills, 
are are things that that will come um, quite quite uh, you know clear uh, to to uh, shipbuilders for for tenders for official tenders. Commercial um, companies don't really look at that. They look at the best deal, the best ship, or the, the best you know equipment um, for for their money. So that there is a difference in 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 how we we are working already in in the United Kingdom. Um, well, I think it it really shows my my short introduction here uh, that I am not a lawyer. I'm 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 a commercial guy um, selling boats to to Scottish um, to Scottish customers. Um, I I heard you say Tony. Maybe I can react to that already. Registry taking longer. We don't really face that um, yet as as a shipbuilder. Um, documents on PDFs, uh, MCA um, banks have always been very helpful. Our customers have been very helpful. Um, PDFs indeed are, are accepted in many cases now. Um, so you know the whole process of, of registry um, needs a little bit more attention, but it 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 still goes on quite quite nicely. Um, a practical view, a practical view always helps. Our customers are helpful. We are helpful. Usually, the banks or MCA are, are helpful as well. So, um, if there is a problem, um, one or two meetings, explanations, we'll, we'll sort it out. And that's my experience. It's it's not negative. It needs time. It needs attention from all parties involved, really. And if you do that, um, again, there's always a solution to to a problem and the problem usually appears to be quite small um you said pre-thoughts pre-planning well that's that that's what you do uh, i suppose you know uh, to get to get matters um uh, sorted two sides are um are needed um regulation on on environmental uh, issues for us again it's technology um uh, environmental friendly ships to be offered is technology. It's different fuels. It's different boats. It's more electrical power. It's it's all of that. Um, so we look at that from a very very technical um, uh, uh, viewpoint. Um, sustainability, uh, same thing really. It's a market where we have to find our way as a as a, a sales um, company uh, selling in these in these markets. So it's very technical from from our point of view. Um, from a legal point of view, we don't see many differences other than, you know, it might be specified very clearly. And then, of course, you, it's, it's a different, uh, different ball game. So that's, um, that's basically where we are. And that's where, where we're at. Um, important, of course, is the supply chain, which is um, uh, important for us. Has to develop still, I, th I think, uh, is developing right now, by, by um, especially on the on the west coast near near Glasgow, where all that's um, that's happening, and and I'm very happy with all these developments because it does give us um, a good um, a good um, market to to keep working in. So, uh, thank you. Thanks, thanks, Mike. That's um, very helpful to hear. I'll stop sharing the screen, by the way. I could have done that years ago, but. <laughs> Here we it's go. Okay. Um, well, thank you for that, Mike. That's very helpful from a practical perspective. And I think um, some of the stuff that John touches on will touch on some of the legalities around some of the practical points that you picked up. And as, as you say, it's, a, it's good to get the steer of the practical together with the legal. So, um, John, on that basis, I'll hand over to you if you want to um, run through a couple of years of the life cycle of a vessel and, and ensuring you're taking account of what your funder might be looking for and uh, maybe picking up a couple of things that Mike touched on there as well. Okay, thanks. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, thanks for that, Mike. Yeah, there'll, there'll be some crossover, I think, in what I'm going to say just now with, with what you've just touched on, especially around the building contract piece. Uh, and, and I suppose I invite you to, to jump back in with, with any uh, further comments or um, can I give us a bit more from perspective from your side of it if, if, uh, as appropriate? Um so as Tony just alluded to, I'm going to look at funder readiness during the life cycle of a vessel. Um, I'm concentrating on the main interactions you'll have with the lender during the life cycle of your vessel from uh, funding a new build or an acquisition, or whether it's requesting consent for a charter arrangement, a change of flag or change of registration, 
whether you're selling a vessel that's subject to refinancing or suppose uh, doing a uh, sorry subject to a financing or whether you're doing a refinancing of a an existing arrangement which uh, has vessels um, as part of that. Um, I suppose what we're going to concentrate on is, is, is looking at the lender's perspective and, and what they will be trying to achieve. And I suppose using that perspective then to try and make your dealings with the lender more efficient and effective and hopefully saving time, money and, and effort. I think under readiness is, is probably the right comment there is, is, is if you can get your ducks in a row, then it makes um, the process, should make the process a lot more straightforward. Yeah, uh, and say, uh, Mike, I would invite you to kind of jump in as I go along. Um, so the first transaction we're going to look at is one of the more common ones is the acquisition of a, a new build vessel. Um, and I suppose with the lender's involvement in that will be fairly straightforward as it's, it's usually financing or assisting the financing of, of that acquisition. Um, so broadly, a buyer's interests will be aligned to those of the lender in that scenario. Um, but there will be instances where a buyer may be minded to take a more commercial view on a matter which a lender may not be comfortable with, whether it's down to its credit approval policy or just a, a, a kind of more risk averse approach to a transaction. Um, and I suppose that always has to be borne in mind if um, if you are getting external funding, is, is it's not just I suppose um, protecting your own interests, but the, the, maybe a slightly different perspective coming from from uh, the third party finance as, as well. So that has to be thought of. And I suppose what the, the kind of overarching message which will probably come through. This kind of short 10 minute presentation will be that I suppose early engagement of your lender and, and I suppose professional advisors for each side is, is probably um, going to be advantageous and all of that and, and try and tie out any issues early or during the course of negotiations, I suppose, and our practical experience. And I suspect Michael would agree with this is it's much easier to deal with those types of things as they come up during negotiations rather than having a, a, a contract. Uh, then you get to the end of it, it's closed off and it has to get maybe reopened because something's come up which a lender's not comfortable with. So certainly an easier conversation to have during the course than uh, at the back end of a transaction. I suppose the other thing about bringing in your lender and, and lender's advisors early is um, just around kind of deal timing. What you don't want to have is everyone ready to go and I suppose the lender still to do the review and uh, I suppose there's just a bit of delay involved in that process because the lender's advisors are going to have to take time to, to look at documentation, but also if there is anything that comes out of that, again, there's, there's further delay uh, and, and potentially costs involved in, in, in um, trying to sort out any issues that, that do crop up. Um, I suppose looking at the kind of key concerns, as we've seen in our experience for lenders, there's a number of things to take into account. So location of the shipyard or the jurisdiction of its incorporation is, is, is an important uh, consideration for a lender. It might be Simple as there's a political or reputational reason why they don't want to deal with a certain country or jurisdiction or, 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 or policies and internally why they can't. Um, there's a, the element that Tony touched on earlier, there's the kind of legal end of it as well, where you want to know that the party you're dealing with is, is properly incorporated, has power and capacity to do what it's transacting to do, and you're not going to have any issues come enforcement um, in relation to that. I suppose to that extent, it may be that if you're dealing with um, a shipyard that's not within the Scottish UK market or uh, the lenders then looking potentially to, for legal opinions is, is on that uh, from the local law jurisdiction uh, and solicitors based there. Um, and again, that's just a timing and, and, and cost factor that, that has to be considered and, and try and iron out if there's going to be, that's going to be required early in the, in the transaction. And again, Brexit now plays a bit of consideration that I don't tend to uh, to add anything to what Tony was saying, but really just need to, to bear in mind now that I suppose recognition of, of the UK or, or Scottish English court judgments um, throughout the EU is, is now a, a different um, prospect than when it was as, as part of the EU. And I suppose we're just going to see how that plays out in the coming uh, months and, and years. But uh, I suppose we wouldn't imagine there going to be any great issues around that, but uh, I suppose just an, another consideration now. Uh, the governing law of the, the bill contract itself, again, will, will be a consideration as, as Mike um, has mentioned in his presentation, there's probably going to be different views on that and, and this who, which law you want to, to govern it and which kind of uses the path to completion um, best. I suppose typically in the UK or the Scottish market, we would see English law being used for a lot of this type of thing, uh, especially where there's multiple jurisdictions in, involved. Uh, there's a kind of wider recognition of, of English law as an acceptable kind of 
standard in, in international commerce, whereas if it is a, a purely Scottish deal, though, we, we would tend to see it governed by Scottish law as, as well. Um, and yeah, it's not to say we won't see it governed by other laws such as Netherlands or, or Norwegian law or other common ones um, in terms of transactions we've been involved with. And I suppose if we are dealing with jurisdictions out with what would be the bank's immediate um, area of, of dealings, then I suppose, again, we're looking at potential for, for the need for legal opinions about the enforceability of, of that bill contract under that that law. And I suppose that's the flip side of maybe Mike's argument is for, from Mike's side, the ease of using Netherlands law for, from the build contract, uh, for the builder based in, in, in the Netherlands uh, versus, I suppose, a kind of UK bank funding it might uh, then require them the official step of a, a legal opinion. So I suppose it's a, a kind of a trade-off, as, as Mike says, I suppose, trying to get a reasonable answer uh, with, with all parties being involved in the conversation um, early doors. Again, there's, there's Brexit considerations there about this recognition of, of judgments. Um, standards, well, the form of the document won't typically be driven by the, the lender. The lender will look at what has been agreed broadly between the, the, the buyer and seller, but I suppose there's a a general recognition again in the market that BIMCO or, or something close to BIMCO is, is generally going to be acceptable. Um, we we'll often see as it's Michael to the fact that uh, builders will have their own bespoke contracts, but there'll be an underpinning of that from the kind of commercial standards we would see kind of in BIMCO and the other kind of standard form industry uh, standards that are out there. So it's, that, I suppose, is the kind of baseline expectation that will be there or thereabouts around, around those commercial position. Now, obviously, the, the lender is kind of a step removed from it, so they're not they're doing the day-to-day negotiation or, or to decide the ins and outs of the contract. I suppose what they're looking for, or what we perceive they're looking for, is, is an overarching piece that, I suppose, are you getting the vessel to a specification you're looking for? Is it coming at the cost you're looking for? Will it arrive on time? And I suppose, what are the implications? And is there any hidden liabilities in there? So they'll be looking very much, again, back to this being aligned with, with its buyer and borrower and what it's looking at, but who's responsible for building design responsibility? Is there subcontracting in there? And we come up, do you feel there's coverage there to make sure the subcontractor is, is the responsibility of the builder or, or, or we come to wherever it lies? Um, what are the payment terms? Is it stage payments? Uh, if it was sign off, as Mike mentioned, which is quite common, would be the classification sign off at various milestones, which give comfort to lenders along the way. Um, I suppose a big issue will be where the lender's money is actually coming into the, the transaction if, if uh, a borrower or a buyer is going to be using its own money in the first instance. Um, um, that's less of a less of a concern, I think, to the lender if they're coming in at the back end. But I suppose if they're involved in stage payments throughout, they're going to have more of a concentration on that. So that's probably, again, a case-by-case basis. Um, they'll be looking at monitoring, inspection along the way, and, and then delivery dates, delivery mechanics, they're looking at the post-completion guarantee period um, and termination rights along the way. I suppose a lot want to get find out that the builder has got rights of termination, which um, could do something to deal all their funding or rip at risk the money they've got out the door. Um, I suppose we're looking at damages and dispute resolution provisions and expecting them to be fairly normal. Um, and and this, now there's COVID considerations as well as, as Tony mentioned around force majeure and, and what happens due to inevitable delays if if, if it's uh, going to lockdown or the like uh, as it's happened and I suppose in numerous occasions across various jurisdictions uh, and will no doubt had an impact on the timeline of vessels I suppose how does that have a wider impact on the, the offer of funding the timing of that and the, and the ability to draw down under that so all relevant considerations I think then we move on to what what would regard as the covenant of the shipyard, and I think this is what Mike was touching on, is about whether we think the shipyard are dealing with or the lender feels that the shipyard are dealing with um, in itself has a strong enough covenant to be guaranteeing its own performance, but also the repayment of monies should the contract be terminated by the by the buyer uh, in accordance with the contract, which would entitle it to repayment of the, the sums. Um, and I suppose if the shipyard itself meets that test with the lender, then performance guarantees and refund guarantees are probably not going to be uh, of a great concern, whereas I suppose if, if it, depending on how the shipyard is structured, they may, to de-risk themselves, move elements of that into kind of special purpose vehicles, which themselves are not great asset holding entities, and I suppose from a risk profile for a lender, then their recourse is, is more limited in that scenario, so they might look to a, a parent company or uh, the like for a performance guarantee and equally a, a refund guarantee from 
from a, another bank, which I suppose guarantees in the scenario that, that, that their borrower is, is going to get the payments refunded if there is a breach of the contract, which entitles them to, to terminate and demand repayment. And, and again, I suppose that's a key concern for the lender there if, if they've been involved in, in helping fund those payments uh, to make sure, I suppose, at the stage where they don't have a vessel to take security over. That, that, that there's certainty of funds coming coming back the way if if the build breaks down for for whatever reason, um, and there's a, there is a flip side to that as well because the covenant works both ways because there will be scenarios that you might what is to that where um, the yard wants comfort from the buyer as well of their covenant to make the payments as and when they fall due, and I suppose that's where we look at, at payment guarantees the other way where. Um, your own lender may be asked to provide a payment guarantee to confirm that the money will be made available at these staged um, completion milestones. And again, I suppose it's about speaking with your lender early in that process to make sure that that facility would be made available and I suppose what, what the requirements and cost implications of that might be for you and um, getting all that out and open earlier rather than later in the, in the process. The final bit around the, the new build contract, the concentration would just be on ability to register the vessel in whichever Registry is, is intended, I suppose, for us, it would be the MCA typically, um, if it's operating in the Scottish or the wider UK market. So we're looking at delivery mechanics. Where is the vessel? Where are we, where are we taking over control of the vessel? Uh, and at that point, what are the practicalities of making sure all surveys are completed, classifications are completed, codings completed, and all the various other requirements the MCA will have before allowing it to be registered? There um, and I suppose that the documentation deliverables as well that would be required and along with that, so a bill of sale in, in the UK standard market form, etc. Um, so all of that's just kind of ticking the boxes to make sure that the build contract, as it typically would, would cover all of that to, to the extent that that lenders um, required. But again, I suppose the, the overarching message is, is is the early engagement is, is key for us. I know the bike was saying that the, for them, the build contract only comes at the end of the process of actually agreeing to buy or sell the vessel. But I think early engagement and the actual negotiation of the, the, the kind of crossing the T's and dotting the I's on that contract is getting the lender involved. I think uh, at the start of it rather than once it's all been agreed between buyers and sellers, probably a, uh, more advantageous in terms of um, timing. Uh, risk and, and cost factors. Um, I suppose as a very similar stream to that would be the acquisition of an existing vessel. Uh, so much of the same considerations would apply for a lender. Again, the starting point is buyer and its lender's interest will be aligned. You want the vessel for price and on time, um, but there will be intricacies where they maybe have slightly different views on slightly different uh, provisions of, of the buying, buying and selling process. So again, it's just about Opening that dialogue. Um, again, a key concern will be the location of the seller um, and I suppose where it's, it's, it's jurisdiction and cooperation. Again, whether or not you need legal uh, opinions from local law, solicitors confirming the power and capacity to transact, what will be the underlying governing law of the sale contract. Again, is it, whether it's English law, Scottish law, or, or, or Netherlands law, or otherwise. Um, and I suppose then lender considering whether or not. It's going to require an enforceability opinion. Again, there's market standard forms, BIMCO or a kind of bespoke contract aligned to, to that type of thing. And, and, and it's similar terms as, as what you'd find with a new build, slightly less detailed, but we're still going to be concentrating on payment terms, delivery dates, what warranties we've got post completion, termination rights, damages, dispute resolution, <laughs> all, all very similar. Uh, and again, the covenant of the seller comes into it from a lender's perspective, and um, whether the warranties have to come from from parent company or somebody else, for, which there's a feeling that they're better able to deliver what's required. Um, and again, we we'll look at registration, uh, especially it's a lot easier if the vessel's already registered in the, the mark in the, the, the registry, which it's going to be registered in subsequently, or where you're going to operate it. But if there's subsequent registration requirements, and they'll have to be um, thought of as, as, as well. So, in, um, conscious of times approaching the end, do you want to maybe cover the, the, I suppose the re-registration of a vessel and then there come a couple of things that were yeah, so was just, just, that maybe quite of interest before we wrap up. Yeah, so just uh, yeah, I'll come on to that just very quickly. So, I suppose just quickly to cover for that charters again. It's just I suppose we're again interested in the line between that by you and your lender here that and that. Putting a vessel out to earnings is going to be a lot better. Um, 
but depending what arrangements you have with your lender, that may require consent. Um, I suppose the difference being for a lender, things they look at is whether it's a time, time charter, bare boat charter, and length of that charter, what the vessel's going to be used for. But there's certain arrangements in there that you'll have to, again, want to open that that dialogue early. I, I suppose think about that, that as well as a, as a point in negotiating your initial contracts with the lender. That what are you going to be using these vessels for? What's in the offing? And, and whether you need to be building in the ability to, to be able to, to um, charter to a certain level without, without having to go to the lender for consent. Yeah, and then connected to that is, as you mentioned, Tony, uh, probably a, a fairly topical thing is, is whether you're trying to change the use, uh, where, the, where that vessel's operating in terms of waters, where you're reflagging the vessel or you're trying to change its registrations. There's a lot of practical reasons why this might come up. Um, if you are going to operate a vessel in new waters, it may be that you want to change the flag on that vessel, which requires a, a re-registration. It may be that whoever is charting a vessel from you has a specific requirement about flag a flag, whether it's a government contract or not. So as part of all of that process, what we've seen a lot of fairly recently is people looking to, to re-register, re-flag, and, and some fairly complex situations coming out of that. Um, we've had a scenario whereby uh, what is an MCA UK registered vessel at the moment may get registered in the Cayman Islands, which is not a red ensign registry. So ultimately... Um, follows you, it's kind of governed by the MCA, and which means that you can transfer it like a, a transfer a port as opposed to a brand new registration, and you can take security with it. But the reason for that was just a reciprocal arrangement with Caymans and other registries, um, including the French register, which allows you to do a short term registration of a bare boat charter and to then fly the flag of that other country short term. Um, so there's, there's various options like that, trying to maintain the integrity of your underlying registration and any security you've given out to your lender, but whilst allowing the flexibility to operate in different jurisdictions or in different waters, flying different flags. And yeah, there's, as Mike said, as a, as a general point, the industry itself is, is always very uh, collaborative and helpful. And we, uh, people try to, in the registry, try to make things work. So we always find there is a solution for however complex situation you may Envisage coming up. Uh, I suppose it's about trying to get all parties again, not to over the, the message, but all parties involved in, in speaking about that uh, as early as possible in the, in the process. Um, the final thing just to talk about was quickly just this, if you're looking to sell a vessel that's subject to finance or if you're buying a vessel that's subject to finance, I suppose all the things you were talking about, Tony, about practicalities of where documentation uh, is just uh, what has to get signed and how you make sure that's all in play uh, and available as and when needed because you want to avoid complex undertakings and, and delivery mechanics around completions. Uh, and I think that probably covers me up pretty quickly just before we run out of time unless there are questions. Um, I think we're more or less out of time. I don't know whether, before we jump into questions, Mike, if you get any yeah. other um, observations on John's legal comments the process versus your practical experience anything that you think well yeah if I may yeah just a quick uh, just a quick reaction on two points um, the, the legal ones well no no um, no comments really I think John's John's hit the nail there um, the the financing it needs time as he said you know and you have to start financing all the talks about financing with the customer uh, early in the process and that sometimes is a bit difficult um, um, the, the buyer obviously has to, to to look into his own financing, and 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 I find what they are looking at um, obviously is is the interest rates of the of the different offer offers, offers they get, um, the down payments, how high it it has to be, or, or how low it can be. These are, are drivers for um, for our customers, whether they talk to banks in in Scotland locally or uh, or even here, they they do that in in the Netherlands as well. Um, all that has to come up during conversation really early. However, um, quite often we are discussing technology, as I said, you know, specifications rather, and um, um, specification equals price. So um, do you want this winch or don't you want that winch? Do you want that extra cabin or don't you want that extra cabin? It's all price. So until you've got the final price, and that's that's the discussion about technology, um, you know, you can get your um, your your... Uh, figure to finance set, as it were. So that's that's always chicken and egg situation. That's that's sometimes um, 
uh, a bit of a hiccup in the in the discussion and the speeds you need in your in your financing um, uh, setup. Um, that's one remark, and the other one was actually on the guarantees. John mentioned them as well. Um, the guarantees really only come into play on bigger projects. So when we are building a more complex ship, um, a year, two year building time, uh, then obviously the pay, the payment schedule and all the all the compliances and and you know all that um, kicks in. The smaller work boats where we do real quick deliveries, it's usually not uh, an issue, not much of an issue. So. Um, yeah, that, that's it really. SPVs, he, he mentioned SPVs. Um, that's for for us as a shipbuilder, a new structure. We we start using it now as well, um, because of all these different shipyards that we have. So that's that's a new a new thing coming up in, in the structure we sometimes choose. But um I think it's important to know that all these guarantees and all these discussions are are usually coming up with the more long term projects only. Yeah, I think that's a valid point. Yeah. Thank you. I see a question, by the way, from Phil Buckley. That's an interesting one. Can I can I react to that, Tony? Maybe? No, absolutely. I was going to you, you beat me <laughs> to the punch, Mike. <laughs> Very good. Um, uh, I looked at it. So, um, do we believe that the entire marine and blue economy are joined up? Well, I'm afraid not. Is my is my answer. Um, I don't think there's a coherent regulatory. Um, um, oversight to it all, um, um, the renewables markets are, are under under price pressure. So operators are, are offering against low day rates simply because it's all about the price of energy at the end of the day. And it's, um, it's money, it's affordability, which is driving that market, I find. Um, is that a matter of the market still having to grow up or is that is that for real in, in the long term? I don't know. But the, I don't think that um, it, it's joined up as a, as a strategy by governments to actually say, we really want this. It's price driven. Yeah, I, um, yeah, I, I, I tend to agree with you, Mike, in terms of the, I think, I think the strategy on marine and blue economy is starting to become joined up. And I think, you know, the, from government and uh, from uh, the likes of HIE and development um, agencies looking at that. But I think from a regulatory perspective, I think that it's, there's still um, it's not a joint up. And maybe that's just the disparate nature of, not disparate, but the, the sort of multifaceted nature of the marine economy as you know, all of its constituent parts. And um, it's, but I think there's definitely some room for improvement. I don't know, John, if you have any views on that at all. No, I think I just agree with the sentence there. Um, one other question, um, Mike, uh, from Graham at uh, Clydesdale Bank in relation to um, any other, are there any additional import taxes due to Brexit from buying a vessel from the EU? Um, taxes are something we advise on, Mike, but there was some maybe you've, you've got a view on given you're doing that trade between the EU and, and the UK? Um, it's it's going to be just like you know us selling a boat to Norway. It doesn't really matter for for a shipbuilder. A ship is uh, is a moving good. It's it's not just equipment. So when we sell to um, to Norway, a non EU member, um, it's it's like selling it to the United Kingdom. There, there are no import duties um, until the United Kingdom will start. Um, uh, you know, having import duties on ships, then then it will change, and that's not the case. Um, we find difficulty in selling ships to Canada with heavy import duties, to Brazil with heavy import duties. Um, the United States completely locked locked uh, for, for foreign shipbuilders, but the United Kingdom are are like like France or the Netherlands or Germany or or uh, indeed Norway. Um, so there are no limitations so far until um, legislation kicks in and, and they, they change things. But so long as, as uh, there's no import duties, which is, I find, the best example to use, uh, there's, there's not going to be a, a major change. OK, thanks for that, Mike. Um, OK, well, given the time, I think we'll wrap up with that. Um, from my perspective, it's been 
very helpful from to have Mike uh, along from a practical perspective and get his take on, on the market. Um, John uh, has run through some legal issues to consider if you're funding um, the different cycle, the different elements of the life cycle of the vessel and both a couple of um, topics I touched on at the top in terms of things we're seeing in the market was uh, equally useful. So thank you very much all for attending uh, today and very much value your attendance um, at this hour.